Before we start talking about the album itself, I just want to say it, it is fantastic. I can't stop listening to it. The music is gorgeous. The performances are fabulous and fabulously recorded as well. So I'm really glad I was able to talk with you gentlemen about this today. Right. Oh, thank you. you so much. Yeah, it was uh, a labor of an enormous, an enormous amount of labor of an enormous amount of love. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, these works are related, you know, to, to earlier works, which they take as their point of departure. Um, maybe one of you wants to just talk about the, the idea of the album as a whole. Eli, you want to take the lead there and talk about that? Sure. I think um, we had commissioned Chris to write this piece um, well before the idea of doing an album came about. And I, th I think it may have even been Chris who pointed me towards Jacob's piece. That sounds mm -hmm. very likely. I think that was right. So um, th the connection between them of um, being based on earlier works and kind of expanding, uh, taking a germinal moment from those and expanding it and transforming it um, seemed to make sense as an album. They're both based on works that are, uh, you know, from well earlier periods. Um, and yeah, it just kind of came together that way. That it, and obviously Jacob and Chris um, are part of a collective together, so their aesthetic is you know complementary also. I was at the world premiere of the Stabat Mater. Um, we were joking about this last night uh, at the concert, the CD release concert, uh, which was that uh, it was a it was a student composer concert. We were still graduate students at Yale, and those student composer concerts can get very long. And I remember his was the last piece on the program. It was about 10 o'clock <laughs> at night. And everyone's like, okay, one more piece. Great. And it turns out to be a 30-minute piece. So uh, I'm glad yeah. the piece has had a reception, which is better than its initial uh, premiere, which was just everyone being grumpy about a concert going until almost 11 o'clock. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I right. was not at the premiere. I didn't know them then. But um, I got to know the work. I think Chris told me about it. And then Jacob sent me a recording of the of the premiere like a live recording and it was it's a very beautiful recording from that thing but um the there's like things like i think one of the singers like knocked a mic stand over oh, yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. all kinds of <laughs> other kind of unfortunate things that happen in it but but you know just that uh, you know s some of the interpretive things that we did in our recording are based on things that i had heard in that original cuz obviously that captured the spirit of it so um yeah yeah yeah, uh, knocking a mic stand over, just one of the joys of, you know, live performance. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, when that happens. <laughs> well, while we're talking about Jacob, uh, would you mind just talking a little bit more about his particular piece? And then I want to talk with you, Chris, about your work. They're, they're both so beautiful and really emotional pieces of music. I find myself sort of being swept away by both of these works. Part of it is the, the performance from the string orchestra. There's such a you know, a history uh, of, of sacred music uh, for strings. But in this case, um, Jacob's Stabat Mater is really just kind of a slowed down version of the Pergolesi Stabat Mater, which you include on here as well. Can you talk about how that, that piece is constructed? Sure. And I just, off the bat, I would say that, you know, there's a history of the string orchestra in religious music that gives it a kind of emotional valence but also even in a secular way if you think of Barbara Adagio or more recent yeah. music like when when humans uh, turn toward uh, some of the heavier subjects they often uh, go to string orchestra or uh, in another sense even like different trains for three string quartets is another kind of dealing with a tragedy but string ensemble piece in a different way of sure, looking yeah. at it mm -hmm. yeah Steve Reich yeah yeah so, um, yes, it is a, a, Jacob's piece is based on the Pergolesi, and it's a slowed-down version, and, and the way it starts is just that, that it's almost note-for-note note the, the way that Pergolesi starts, but stretched out so that you're kind of looking at this um, music under a, under a microscope. You're, like, every note takes, you know, where it might have taken three quarters of a second before now the note lasts for 10 seconds or something like that 
I can't remember what the actual... Uh, it's I, very slowed down. It's very slow. I can't remember if it's like eight times. There's some specific amount that it's... Um, and what, what happens, you know, the beginning of the Pergolese, for example, has a very standard kind of Baroque uh, move that Pergolese makes. Is it's just like chain suspensions. So you have, you know, these sort of... These uh, rubbing together of harmonies that quickly, you know, you have the tension and release, uh, but it happens very quickly. When you take that and you stretch it out for 10 seconds, as you have these like very painful, slow um, dissonances that normally yeah. would just quickly, and we're used to dissonances that quickly pass away and it, we barely notice almost, but when you stretch it out, you have that really, it's like a holding a wound open kind of and I think that's part of what Jacob is getting at is sort of really slowing down and that mo like I think in the album notes he says that it's he was thinking about the moments like when you have fallen off a cliff or you're in a car accident and there is research that says your your sense of time slows down so he's sort of literally yeah. done that but I I don't want to end the conversation about that piece there because he doesn't just slow the piece down and that's the whole piece sort of halfway through is that, like uh, the orchestra starts to kind of become unstable so you have this very clockwork uh, way in which the piece unfolds at the beginning where it's slowed down and um, but then all of a sudden like we start to get strange vibrato in, in the inner voices and then the singers start to kind of slide from note to note and then it, yeah. when we get toward the climax of the piece where it's really starts to become very intense the, the strings start to have these slow downward glissando. It's almost like a vortex. It's like sucking the orchestra down into some kind of void. And it's quite, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard when you're, I, my job conducting that piece is just to, is just to be very steady and very slow <laughs> in my conducting. And it's, it's hard to, to do that and also convey the like wrenching things that are happening. But, you know, I sort of have to let the orchestra and the singers do that and just be completely, well, there's a, still. there's a challenging thing in that score, right, where you have to go from quarter note equals 17 yeah. to quarter note equals 19. These an extraordinarily yeah. slow tempi. I, to be honest, I don't... In the recording, I, I'm using a click track, so it starts out um, and I'm and it's exact. When I'm doing it ju in the performance, we, we opted not to use the click track, and I don't think I was actually doing 16 because it's so difficult to to time that exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah um but yes you have to incrementally speed the 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 um tempo up um because if you do it that slow once the singers come in which happens about it's maybe like 25 bars but it's about six minutes of music um once they come in the tempo has to be a little bit uh faster for them to be able to uh sustain their their um their, mm -hmm. their pitches. Well, I was going to point that out, and it's fascinating to hear a little talk about, you know, what's under the hood of this piece. But my first thought listening to the singers was, boy, it, that requires a lot of stamina to, yeah. to be able to sing those phrases slowed down. And I love the way that, that Jacob kind of um, exaggerates the slowing down a little bit through the, the you know, the, the slides, the glissandi from the voices and, and the way they sometimes come off of phrases. The phrase just kind of, you know, collapses a little bit and, and that gets echoed in the orchestra yeah. as you go along. And even the, the silences are exaggerated as mm. well. Those are slowed down. Yeah. But toward the end, after this part you talk about where it, it starts to disintegrate a little bit, then it, it pulls itself back together and it seems like you have real-time singing of the text at the very end. That's right. Well, just one thing about the slowed down part in the middle, in the recording we were able to use two singers and because you know you can with through studio magic they were able to sing the parts just the two of them um but because the notes last for so long in a in a live performance you actually have to have two singers on each part so when we do it live we have four singers and you know 
uh, the the parts dovetail so that one singer is actually taking over the note from the second singer. So part of what you're hearing is that they have to have this amazing breath control on these long notes, but then, you know, one voice will actually, one singer will take over from the other. So it's sort of this beyond human capability um, yeah. note. So then, yes, at the end, you have this wrenching climax that's that sort of comes down. Um, and then you have... When I was instructing the orchestra how I wanted it to sound, I I kind of came up with a corny uh, image, which was like in a in a movie when someone dies and they like enter into heaven, and it's this kind of like bright white um, scene where like you know somebody in white walks up to them and talks to them. It's that kind of I mean that's a cheesy idea, but in that is the kind of feeling you get. You've gone through this whole emotional turmoil. And then you have these beautiful, simple, non-vibrato chords that are very sort of crystalline that come in. And then over the top of that, you have a not slowed down, like you said, it's in real time. One soprano just singing in a chant-like way the text of, um, of the Sabbat Mater over that. In a, and it's almost like childlike. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's like a cathartic moment at the end of release. I can definitely confirm that as a uh, first-time listener. I know you lived with this piece for a long time, but I, I can tell you just listening to it for the first time, it had quite a, a, an emotional impact, especially if you know the text and you know what Stabat Mater is about. And, and Jacob has kind of elevated it from Mary's grief over the death of her son Jesus to, you know, the, the grief of mothers everywhere. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's really an effective piece. Now, I have to say, when you when you listen to everything in sequence on this recording, and that Paganini Caprice comes up right after half an hour of of Jacob's <laughs> Stab at Mater, it, it sounds totally alien. I, I was <laughs> thinking I had no idea Paganini was so you know progressive uh, in his time. But that kind of segues a little bit into your piece, Chris, because you, that you take that as your point of departure, right? You begin this piece high windows with sort of a little bit of a paraphrase of the a pumped up kind of version of the opening of the Paganini? Yeah, um, it's funny because a friend of mine had sort of sent me just a series of things to listen to and they were random tracks from different albums. So it wasn't like really in context. And I remember, you know, having heard the, you know, the, the famous Caprices, having heard that one. And it was, I remember it was a recording by the violinist Tom Sehetmer, who's an amazing violinist, but has a very kind of distinct way of playing. And it was so different and so strange sounding. I was like, this, this is, this is kind of amazing. And, you know, I think if I just stole this kind of first bar of this piece, I think no one would ever really notice it, um, as being recognized by Paganini, unless the kind of it's in context on this album. Uh, but yeah, that sort of got me going on it. Cause I think I was struggling with the time with the idea of virtuosity. And I think I was not at that time quite yet interested in virtuosity. And so I needed to find a way into having these musicians do, you know, it was a concerto. I was commissioned to write a concerto. And sort of, so this figuration from this, you know, master of string writing unlocked something for me about how to make the piece happen. But, you know, as, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I was working with a violinist and at the time was a member of the orchestra. And I was like, okay, now, you know, take this figuration, but like, do it all super sul ponticello right on the bridge and make it incredibly noisy. And then what does that sound like? And that's basically the opening of the piece. And then I'm like, add some open strings. And so that's really the, the opening inspiration from the work. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I love the way that you use harmonics above sort of the foundation, foundational strings below it to, to create this very uh, atmospheric, you know, feeling, like, like looking up. And I assume that has something to do with the inspiration for the piece, High Windows. Can you talk about, you know, where that comes from? Yes, it's actually from a poem by Philip Larkin, um, which is about this, like, you know, like all Philip Larkin poems are about a slightly craggy narrator who's uh, a little grumpy. And um, but looking back on his life and thinking about, you know, sort of all these different things. And and but finally, uh, the end of the poem it has this, story, you know, the, and, and this is nowhere the, the you know, he's basically transcending his own notion of faith into something a little bit deeper, I think, even of, you know, at like an endless nowhere is, I think, what he describes the end of the poem. And I think that was the the feeling that I was trying to, to connect with, you know. And of course, it had really, it had literally been written for this um, beautiful church in Brooklyn that the String Orchestra Brooklyn often performs in uh, called uh, Church of St. Anne. And it in fact does have very high windows and so the title sort of took on these multiple meanings where I literally thought of the sound, the opening sounds of the piece, with this incredible resonance of that church just sort of floating up into the high windows. And so I took the literal title from Larkin, but it takes on a lot of different meanings. Talk a little bit about the other collaborators on this disc. Chris, you have the, the Argus Quartet along with the string orchestra. What what role do those two groups play off of each other, or do they play together throughout Well, the you know, it's so funny, and just as, you know, we were talking about this album, is that I realize I have personally collaborative relationships with everyone on this album. So, you know, you have, obviously, the Argus Quartet, who are the soloists. Anytime you're hearing fast, loud notes, or high notes, or... Uh, that's them, and it was kind of it was originally written for another quintet, the uh, the two my quintet in Brooklyn, who are not so active anymore. Um, but you know, Argus is a group. They were at Yale about a generation after me, not a generation, but maybe five years after me, and they reached out to me about playing some music, and they just became really close friends and steady collaborators. I've worked with them quite. They played two different string quartets of mine, and so when we were looking for a group for this album, they just seemed like a really natural fit. But I was just thinking further about this is uh, Rachel Lee Friday, who plays the Paganini Caprice on the album. She, I actually wrote her a violin sonata probably about five years ago um, that she commissioned. And Melissa Hughes and Kate Maroney, the two singers on the album, are very frequent collaborators of mine and both appear on my own most recent album, my most recent full-length album. So it's really lovely to just see all these people who I think are just incredible musicians and lovely people all in one album. Well, and you talk about your work, High Windows, as a piece that you you wrote for friends from a specific period in your life. So this is sort of a, a family affair. It feels that way, and that's. I mean, I think that I do think that there really is a connection between the. This is probably my definitely my most performed orchestra work, and uh, you know, I do think the fact that it was kind of made for specific people and made with the kind of love that you make works for, for friends. You know, Eli used to live two blocks from me, and, I used, you know, I would see him even more frequently then. Uh, not so much now, because he's married, he's having a baby soon, so... <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're very... You know, saw him all the time, and uh, my my ex-partner was in the uh, orchestra, so I saw her all... You know, she I was at SOB concerts all the time, I knew how they played, and the members of the original Christian group were also... Uh, close friends of mine and so it's just this feeling of when you know someone you can write something really specific and sort of you know that very feeling I think really goes to make special works I think you know it's much harder to compose for an abstract group that you don't know or not super well as opposed to people you could call up I remember John the Chisel original solo cello player gave me a lot of ideas about specific figuration and um, and also that it went through a bunch of versions. You know, this piece has been revised quite a bit since the premiere. Um, and, you know, the fact that the SOB has been there the whole time, you know, playing each version of the piece is really special and nice.
composer Christopher Cerrone and conductor Eli Spindle talking about the debut album from the String Orchestra of Brooklyn with music by Chris Cerrone and Jacob Cooper. Also related works by Pergolesi and Paganini. The album is called After Image. It's from New Focus Records and you can visit the String Orchestra of Brooklyn online at thesob.com for more information. Christopher Cerrone and Eli Spindle, thanks so much for taking the time to share your music and this beautiful album with us today here on FN91. No problem. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.